Here's a question for you. Why do Studio Ghibli films feel so different? I mean, there is breathtaking animation, amazing music that goes harder than legally allowed, and magnificent performances. We all know that. <laughs> but what is happening underneath all that on a storytelling level? Because the way Hayao Miyazaki structures and tells his stories is drastically different from the way we used to in the West. Now. This process isn't unique to him, in fact it's widely common in Japan, China, South Korea and other countries in the region, but I'll be focusing on Studio Ghibli to celebrate the release of The Boy and the Heron and because you don't need to ask me twice for a Miyazaki marathon. So let's unpack it. First we need a point of comparison. When I say Western story structure, what do I mean exactly? And bear in mind, in this video I'm going to generalize a lot. Naturally, there are many western stories that use unconventional structure, but to simplify the process, when I say western stories, I'll be referring specifically to the most common and mainstream way of storytelling. And you probably already have a few contenders in mind. There is Aristotle's dramatic theory, but that's just too broad. Basically, it just says that each story has the beginning, middle and end. On the other side, we have Joseph Campbell's monomyth and all of its modern permutations, but that's too specific. Less of a story structure and more of a template or a recipe. We need a middle ground. And thankfully there is one. And to find out what it is, we need to go back in time a bit and meet a man named Gustav Freytag. Freytag was born in Poland in 1816, and later he moved to Germany. He was a pretty successful playwright and novelist, and also he was a racist nationalist. His most famous series of novels, Debit and Credit, was filled to the brim with anti-Polish and anti-Jewish sentiments, and proclaimed the superiority of the Germans. So, overall not a great guy. The kind of guy that BJ Blaskowitz would have had a problem with. Right, BJ? In 1863, Freytag wrote De Technique des Dramas, a book on story structure where he took Aristotle's idea of a narrative triangle, modified it and came up with this. Freytag's Pyramid. A story structure that has been the bedrock for Western storytelling ever since. Freytag's Pyramid has five main points. Exposition, where we set up the world, characters, and importantly, where we launch the core conflict through an inciting incident. Act 2, or Rising Movement, is all about building that central conflict. Our protagonist tries to reach their goal, they meet various obstacles, including the antagonist, as we get to the highest point of tension and the moment where fate turns on the protagonist, uncovering their inner strength or weakness as they continue their battle with the antagonist. In Fallen Action, the conflict between the protagonist and the antagonist reaches its closing moment and we have the Numa, or as Freytag called it, catastrophe, a moment where conflict is resolved and the protagonist either wins or loses and we tie up the rest of the story. Now. The two main characteristics that are crucial to this type of story structure is the central conflict and thus the need for the protagonist-antagonist dichotomy. Without these two elements, the whole structure just doesn't move and falls apart. And to someone who grew up used to the western style of storytelling where conflict is key, all of this just might look natural. I mean, don't all stories need conflict? Didn't I just say the same thing in the previous video? Well, sure, if you work within Freytag's type of narrative structure. And here we move to the main point. A basis for Hayao Miyazaki's and many other East Asian storytellers work, and the structure that does not need conflict. Kishizun Ketsu originated in Chinese poetry, then it got picked up in Korea and later found its way to Japan, and it divides the story into four acts. Let's take a look at my neighbor Totora to see it in action. It's 1950s Japan, Tatsuo Kusakabe and his two daughters Satsuki and Mei move into an old house in the countryside to be closer to their mother who is in a hospital. They get to meet some spirits that live in this place, mainly the big one, Totoro. 
The kids explore their new home and discover more about the spirit world. They meet Totoro again a couple of times, see the Neko bus, and renovate their home to make it ready for when their mom, Yasuko, finally comes back. Which should be pretty soon, the doctor said that they'll keep her for a couple of days and then she's free to go. But the family receives a message from the hospital saying that they cannot let Yasuko go because she's still sick. Satsuki and Mei are worried, what if this illness is serious and mom will never come back. They have a bad argument and the 4 year old Mei decides to go to the hospital alone to bring this corn ear to her mom. But she gets lost which prompts everyone in the village to go look for her. But there is no trace. Desperate Satsuki goes to Totoro and asks to help find her sister. With the help of Totoro and Nekobas, Satsuki finds lost Mei and together they go to the hospital where they find out that their mother just had a minor cold, nothing serious. Doctors decided to keep her just to be safe. The kids leave the corn ear for Yasuko and eventually she comes home. You probably already noticed some things. Who's the antagonist of the story? Is it this boy Kanta? Well, he teases the girls for living in a haunted house and acts weird a couple of times. But he probably just has a crush on Satsuki. I mean, he shares his umbrella in the rain and later even helps to look for Mei. So, not our guy. But then, who is? The doctors? They never really appear in the story and all they do is just try to cure Yasuko. What's going on? Where is the main conflict here? There isn't one. And that's the point. Unlike western story structures that use the central conflict between protagonist and antagonist, Kishoto Ketsu does not rely on them at all. It does not mean that it's against them, no, you can still use these elements, but they are non-essential. Put it this way. If we take the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the whole story is built around the quest to bring the One Ring to Mount Doom and destroy it. Our protagonists, the Fellowship, want it so that they can put an end to Sauron and his threat. But Sauron wants to get the ring back so that he can restore his power and finish his conquest of Middle-earth. If we remove the ring from this equation, everything falls apart. Frodo has no need to go to Mount Doom, Fellowship never gets created, basically you have no story. Kishutan Ketsu on the other hand builds the momentum around the twist part that changes the direction of the story and brings new and unexpected information. Some people interpret this as a complication or a climax and there is nothing wrong with that, but strictly speaking, it's just that, a twist. And looking at the story this way opens up a lot of possibilities that simply cannot happen within the framework of the western story structure. If you have been learning storytelling for some time, you probably have come across this idea that a well-written character should have a flaw in them, that they fix towards the end of the story to overcome the forces of antagonism. Commonly this is referred to as a character's ghost or the lie that the character believes in. John Truby described it as an event from the past that still haunts the hero in the present, an open wound that is often the source of the hero's psychological and moral weakness. In general, protagonists in Studio Ghibli films do not work that way. Some of them do have character arcs that are similar to the western types, but as a general rule they do not undergo major shifts in personality in order to overcome the obstacles they encounter. I really like the interpretation that in western stories a character embarks on a journey that changes their beliefs, but in Japanese stories the journey tests the beliefs that they already hold, like in Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. At the beginning of the story, Nausicaa already believes that the Oms, these giant insect-like creatures, aren't a threat, and she also doesn't think that burning down the toxic jungle will solve the problem of the world slowly dying. If anything, over the course of the story her views prove to be true, when she learns that the plants in the jungle actually purify the polluted planet, which she kind of already knew before. So, because Kishuten Ketsu does not rely on an overarching conflict, character changes are more subtle, and character arcs are more freeform or flat, which can be so unaccustomed for the Western audience that this happens. A new home and a new school? It is a bit scary. I think I can handle it. Yes. They added new lines to the film. As a matter of fact, it happens a few times in Spirited Away, mostly for exposition purposes, but here the motive is pretty clear. Let's break it down and keep these two lines in mind. 
In the first scene, Chihiro and her parents are driving to their new home, and understandably, Chihiro doesn't really like the idea of going to the new school. Then the rest of the film happens. Chihiro saves her parents and Haku, they get back from the spirit world and go home. This is how the story goes in the original script, but not in the official English dub. They close the loop by bringing back the new school and showing that now Chihiro is strong and can handle it, which has absolutely nothing to do with the original. And you could also argue that this really oversimplifies the message of the film. You start to understand why it happened once you learn about the people behind the dubbed version. The project was helmed by major figures in the American animation industry. They knew how to tell stories, but they only knew how to tell stories their way, with closure, distinct character arcs, and clear messages. And they were so hell-bent on their methods that they reined in the story into a shape that was familiar to them, frankly speaking, robbing it of its original nuance. So, we talk structure, we talk character arcs, and we talk change. What's left? While there are many antagonist-like characters in Japanese stories, the way they function is very different. Oftentimes they may act with malice and not being nice, and yet they aren't in direct conflict with the protagonist. Let's go back to Spirited Away for a second. Here, Yubaba, the owner of the bathhouse, kind of plays the role of the antagonist. She takes away Chihiro's identity and keeps her parents in the peak form. And yet she's mostly absent from Chihiro's quest. You get the sense that she almost doesn't really care about it. And you'd be right. Even more, she wasn't the one who trapped Chihiro in the spirit world. When Chihiro first meets Yubaba, she tells her on the spot that this isn't the place for her and she needs to go. And only after Chihiro insists on working at the bathhouse does she take away her name. You could argue that she didn't want to give back Chihiro's parents, which I mean, true. But even then, compared to similar western characters, she doesn't do much to stop Chihiro. This brings us to another interesting point. In all of Miyazaki's stories that feature antagonist-like characters, they are never defeated. Not in the way we're used to, at least. After Chihiro frees her parents, she just leaves. And Yubaba continues her business as usual. In Nausicaa, Princess Kushana, the leader of a highly militarized nation of Talmikians that literally invaded the valley and awakened this giant useless super weapon thing, basically just parts ways with other characters and goes back home. The Witch of the Wastes in Howl's Moving Castle, the same one that put the curse on Sophie, later just ends up living with her. Here she is in the final shots. In my opinion, it shows that to these kinds of stories, finding the solution to the problem is much more important than defeating someone. And as a writer, I find it's really liberating, because it gives me way more ways to explore the story. So does it mean that the Western story structure is worse? No, of course it doesn't. I don't want to pick the winner here and I don't think that that's the point. But it is important to remember that there are many ways to tell stories and structures aren't set in stone rules, rather they are instruments that can be played around and experimented with. Traditional western conflict-oriented story structure still has its place and maybe it will suit some stories much better. In a way western story structure reminds me of a road trip where you are going from point A to point B with a clear goal in mind, while Kishotenketsu is more like a hike, where exploration and the sense of discovery is much more important than getting where you need to go. This little research of mine opened me to new possibilities and allowed me to look at storytelling from a new perspective, to see playfulness and artistry. I think in recent times, in the writing community, we have been kind of overpowered by the whole idea that there is only one right way to tell stories, and you need to do this and that and in this specific order, or no one will enjoy your work. And that's just not true. I think the popularity of Japanese and Korean stories in the West shows that you don't need to cater to the familiar to connect with the audience. In a way, this project allowed me to fall in love with writing again and remember that it's actually supposed to be fun and exciting and the possibilities are limitless. So if you're an aspiring or working writer, I hope I made you feel the same way. And if you aren't really interested in writing, first of all, thank you for watching all of this. 
And I hope that this video gave you a new appreciation for the stories you enjoy and allowed you to understand them a bit deeper. See you. And go watch The Boy and the Heron, they don't make many films like it these days.